Good morning, everyone. I hope you can hear me now. I hope you have had uh, a good evening yesterday and a nice dinner and uh, able to catch up with good friends, old friends, or made some new friends. Looking at uh, the hall this morning, uh, I always have that mystery that I'm never able to solve, that why on the second day of the conference, the hall is a bit difficult to fill. I think we should uh, forego the dinners and have the dinner on the second evening. So it's something to think about. There is not much to do for me today and uh, I can sit back and relax and, and let the others do something. But that's not the case. I have got a few things uh, that I would like to get out of the way and uh, hand over to other people. As always, I would like to remind you the World Steel Antitrust Guidance. In essence, it reminds people not to engage in any price-related discussions, any consorted efforts against the customers, suppliers, any division of that sort. If you have got any doubts, please ask one of our colleagues. Because the discussions are of any technical nature, I don't think that we will fall into that category. So we covered a number of topics yesterday, and I am sure you are looking forward to the sessions that we have today. The first session is on hydrogen. There is a lot of discussion when we talk about decarbonization. We start with hydrogen. There are quite a few breakthroughs being done in hydrogen. Some people have already made quite some headways, and some have just started taking small steps there. There are quite a number of obstacles that we need to overcome. But I am sure that we will sooner or later see some breakthrough, at least from the steel industry's side. There are some bottlenecks that are beyond the steel industry's control. For example, the supply of hydrogen in large volumes, as well as the provision of green electricity. So topics like that probably are not going to be discussed. We are going to discuss what the steel industry is doing internally. So there's a range of topics there. It's quite a large session that is going to go beyond coffee break and lunch. So I will just uh, kickstart this one. I will start calling uh, the first presentation, but before I do, I got a question quite often yesterday. Are the presentations available to us? So if you download the website that I have been asking everybody to do, the presentations are already there, which were made yesterday. So my colleagues, they have been doing quite a fantastic job. They have made sure that all the presentations that were made and that will be made today, they will be available. So please do, and you will have access to the presentations. As always, yesterday, as I said, we have got 20 minutes of time for each presentation. You have come here a long way. Make every single minute count from your presentation. So just make a bank. There will be five minutes of Q&A, and that means do not eat into those five minutes of Q&A. Let everybody else try to get their questions answered. So now I will hand over the lead to the session chair, Dr. Kurt Satsinger. He is the lead of strategic projects at Fostalpinia Steel. Kurt has got a background in uh, material sciences and has got a PhD in material sciences and spent uh, quite a long time in the, the high-end steels, electrical steels, as well as high-strength steels, and he looks after now the large-scale strategic projects. And because we are talking about the forward-looking 
developments. He's got a fantastic job at hand that we have for him to moderate this session. So Kurt, please. Good morning, everybody. It's good to be here, and thank you, Rizwan, for this very good introduction. Well, I'm really happy to uh, assist this second session. Um, let, let's say it's the session of the heart of this conference with hydrogen. And as Rizwan uh, said, don't lose time because we have a lot of program here. <laughs> Well, to give a short introduction of the session, the steel industry has already started seeing the use of hydrogen and existing technologies such as blast furnace, well as the cradle and cumbled switching in the case of direct reduction, there are also breakthrough technologies under development intended for the range of ore qualities. This session aims to highlight examples of these developments. This is a very short introduction to summarize it. And uh, we have a number of speakers. And the first speaker is Dr. Samik Nag. He's um, head of Iron Making Research Group at Data Steel. And he brought a presentation with uh, him called Hydrogen Injection to Tears at the E Plus Furnace. Well, Mr. Nag, please come on stage. This is your applause. Warm welcome to have you here, and the stage is yours. <laughs> Have a good morning. So I have to start straight away? It, it should start. Yeah. Oh, good. So, very good morning to all of you. So as they say, morning shows the day. Let me try to do a good work so that you have a good start off in the morning and then have a good day ahead. So here I, from Tata Steel, I will be presenting our work on hydrogen injection in blast furnace. Specific to that, also will give you a broader picture of our journey towards decarbonization. So just a, just a quick overview of Tata Steel. Tata Steel is a 34 million ton steel company. It is the first Asian integrated private steel company established way back in 1907. So we have started making hot metal from 1911. So almost kind of 111, 12 years of iron making. So I'm not, I'm skipping this to comply to the time requirement. If you have any question in any of these slides, I will be happy to answer on stage or out from the stage. So, so, so this is our business overview. We are the 11th largest steel maker and rest you can read in the slide. Slide will be available, I am told. So now to our target, our Indian target, uh, Prime Minister of India has announced that by 2070, India as a nation will be carbon neutral. And for Tata Steel, we have announced that by 2045, we will be carbon neutral. So what does it mean for Tata Steel? I'll show you in the next slide. On the left hand side, you are seeing the present performance. We are steadily decreasing, then somewhere in between, we have increased a bit. This is mostly because of our, we have acquired some plants within India, which are not as efficient as our parent plants. So there is an increase in CO2, but then we are, as they, those plants are coming into production and all the bottlenecks are removed, we are slowly reducing our CO2 footprint. But our present CO2 footprint is 2.45 ton per ton of crude steel. And as I told you, we want to be carbon neutral by 2045. Just to, just to calculate the number, what does it mean for us? We have to get, if we, if we extend this business as usual to our case and assume a 40 million ton of capacity. 
So we have to get rid of kind of 98 million ton of CO2 every year to, to achieve carbon neutrality. So it's not, uh, the sheer numbers shows the magnitude of the problem. So our approach is threefold. So like uh, what we think that uh, level one, the liver one is process improvement. This is inward looking solution. Try to improve the existing process to the extent possible so that the yield improves, fuel rate reduces, productivity increase, and thereby some advantage in CO2. Carbon direct avoidance, not to use avoid carbon or use green carbon to the extent possible so that carbon is not as such not coming into the value chain and thereby reducing our CO2 footprint. And third is carbon capture and utilization. So I'm just keeping the right side, right side of the slide. It is just to show the magnitude. Uh, so we'll discuss this if there is any question later on. So this is the process improvement part. These are, these are few examples we have done to improve the existing process with the resource available within. Not much of intervention, but tweaking the process to the extent possible and get the best result out of it. The CO2 savings, what we have obtained by implementing those ideas are written in the bottom. Small numbers, but does matter when it all adds up and gives some relief on the CO2. Now, on the carbon direct avoidance and carbon capture and utilization, what we are doing, this is depicted in this slide. So on the left hand side, carbon direct avoidance, of course, we are trying to increase the scrap utilization in our steel making process and thereby reduce some amount of hot metal production and carbon generation, CO2 generation. And secondly, in our hardware configuration, almost 92% of the hot metal or iron is produced through blast furnace route. Only 7-8% of iron is produced, that too, in a coal-based DRI process, which is also not very carbon-friendly, CO2-friendly. So as you can understand, a whole of ours, and, and blast furnace being the 70% of the CO2 producer in steel making, our focus is in and around blast furnace. So, so we have the blast furnace, and in our expansion plan, primarily blast furnace will be there because we are located in such a geographic location. We don't have plenty of gas, neither we have a very good quality raw material to make gas-based DRI at a, at a cost equivalent to blast furnace. So, so the solutions of blast furnace, as is known to all of us, is either get rid of carbon by injecting hydrogen bearers, so we are working on it, and also we are working on hydrogen generation, also, we are exploring different routes for alternate iron making, but relatively in a smaller scale. You all might be knowing about Hisarna, the flagship uh, project for Tata Steel. We are actively working to scale it up and come to a commercial installation sometimes in this, this, this decade. On the right-hand part, whatever CO2 we are capturing, we are doing a plethora of project to come with meaningful products out of it so that so that, that can be captured CO2 can be used for some commercially viable process. Long way to go. We are doing some small scale piloting there. So coming to the hydrogen injection, as I was telling that uh, we have a history of long history of iron making through blast furnace route. But uh, Best because of our geography, we have never injected any gas other than oxygen and blast into the blast furnace. So we don't have any experience of doing any gas injection. So we started in a small step and selected coal-based methane as a target gas to do the fast injection trial. Why coal-based methane? Coal-based methane is close to the natural gas composition and may be available in uh, some parts of India. 
So we have done, uh, subsequently, we have, we have done one, one month long trial with uh, CBM, learned the nuance of gas injection, safety aspects, design, control, everything, and then started planning for hydrogen. And then subsequently, we did hydrogen trial. So here, we are depicting the four major things we are doing on carbon direct avoidance in blast furnace. So 2000, January 2022, we have injected CBM on month long trial. December 22nd, we have started with biochar, injecting biochar in our PCI. Up to 10% we have successfully done. We are still using, not to that scale, because availability of biochar is an issue for us. And then started doing, working on hydrogen and injected hydrogen in blast furnace in April 23. And COG, kind of July 25, will be continuously injecting CO2 in one of our blast furnace. So these are the way we are maturing over gas injection, hydrogen BRR injection, and some greener carbon source in blast furnace. Now, on CBM injection, as I told you, this is closer to, this composition wise, this is closer to natural gas. So we did all in-house design development, all in-house logistic development and piping, etc., and got the gas in a specialized vessel of 150 bar or so, then depressurized it, preheated it, and then subsequently injected into the blast furnace. Did all sorts of combination trials for one month and established whatever we want to know uh, from gas handling as well as the techno-commercial numbers for injection of natural gas. So after completion of this, we started preparing for hydrogen injection. So as we all know, hydrogen is colorless, odorless, flame is not visible, etc. At the same time, the reduction process is endothermic. So, so we anticipate that there will be a lot of changes uh, from the conventional blast furnace operation to hydrogen injection. So we started in three phases. So first, to look into the process stability part of the blast furnace. Then, of course, sourcing and logistics. And lastly, to do the material selection, interlock designs, so that successfully injection can be done. Just a quick glimpse on what we have done in lab scale. First of all, very detailed uh, two-dimensional model analysis to see how the isotherm will move, what will be the working line look like. And based on that uh, determined working line, we have done our own uh, modified reducibility and degradation tests, and then kind of tweaked the iron bearing materials composition so that the degradation is within the acceptable limit. Also uh, did uh, very detailed simulation of the cohesive zone of the furnace. We found some very interesting results there which may be very beneficial when we inject hydrogen. And lastly, as hydrogen is a very quick burning gas, we anticipate that as it will be enter entering into the raceway, it will start burning there itself, thereby the, maybe the lens will get heat up and it may melt. So we did the simulation and selected the material and orientation of the metal and necessary cooling arrangement so that this problem can be handled. So doing completion of everything in the lab scale, we move on to the actual blast furnace trial. So in the blast furnace trial, first of all, we did lots of cold simulation for the injection system, which we have kind of designed and uh, came up with number of design interlocks and process interlocks, which anticipates based on when hydrogen will go, what will happen, and then did a very, very detailed PSSR to address all of that. During trial, we put a good amount of access control to the site, and also some uh, detectors specially located so that the, any leakage or any flame can be detected. And lastly, we source this material hydrogen from a, in a pressurized tankers from around 1,300 kilometers away from our location. 
So, of course, that was also not an easy job. We have to take some special permission from the authorities and also do a very detailed planning for securing the hydrogen tankers while they are coming to plant and when we are storing it in some location and subsequently bringing them into the plant. So there was very detailed planning done and we could ex execute it successfully. This is, this is a closer picture of the this valve arrangement system. In the first station, we have kind of depressurized this hydrogen from 200 bar to five bar. And hydrogen, unlike uh, CBM, heats off when it depressurized. So there was arrangement for that as well. So the next valve station was to isolate the blast furnace from the uh, supply side, so that arrangement. And then third valve station was to distribute the hydrogen into two airs. So a, here is a very quick overview, highlights of the hydrogen trial. We did continuous four days trial of hydrogen, changing many of the parameters the way we wanted to do it, doing a very detailed DOE design of experiment of that. Uh, on, a, on a continuous basis, if you see, we, we run the uh, operation into two different phases. The value is given. We have used 40% of the two hours for injection of the hydrogen, and maximum hydrogen injected is 6 kg per ton of hot metal. We, we did see that the resistance in the furnace get reduced as we have seen in our softening melting test and there was a minor loss in raft which was manageable. So this was our, this was our hydrogen story. So based on this, we are now ready to use around 15 kg per ton of fundamental uh, hydrogen injection in our blast furnace as and when it will be available for us. And also we have now arrived at uh, Stegno commercials for that. So beyond hydrogen, what we are doing, here are a few examples. I have told about Hisarna, which is the right part of the slide. Uh, and left part, along with Palurth, we are trying to do some CO2 regeneration and injecting the regenerated CO2 uh, CO into blast furnace. We are in the process of doing some industrial demonstration soon. So if successful, uh, uh, with, uh, we'll be able to, but it has a potential of 50% CO2 reduction. And Hisarna, Hisarna uh, being using the pure oxygen for the purpose, so the specific gas volume is less and whatever is coming out is CO and CO2. So it is easier to capture and if captured, we think that uh, this can produce hot metal at a 80% less CO2 footprint. So there are other advantages of Hisarna as a whole, which is depicted in the bottom part of the slide. So, so as I told you, we have now established how to inject hydrogen in blast furnace. Now next is, step is to get hydrogen. Okay. So next step, so, so globally people are trying electrolyzer and biomass gasifications. We are also doing that. We are not different from that. What we are uniquely trying is by tapping the off mill gases from steel plant and doing some reconfigured chemical looping technology, we are trying to produce hydrogen. So essentially the lab scale things have now completed. We are doing some piloting and we believe that if this project is successful, 10% of the hydrogen demand for this steel plant can be met through this uh, technology. But of course, we have to establish that in the industrial scale. So that was the carbon direct avoidance story for us. And as blast furnace will need carbon and CO2 will be produced, what we are doing to carbon capture and utilization. 
Here are a few projects. I'm already installed five ton CO2 capture plant in our Jamshedpur works, taking blast furnace gas into account. So this small piloting is essentially to learn the nuances of this so that uh, at scale we will be able to now we are confident that at scale we will be able to capture co2 and of course we still don't have any at scale solution for captured co2 utilization we are working on plenty of projects as i have shown you in the previous slides and uh, right now we are also trying to come up with 10 tpd methanol plant taking the blast furnace gas as an input and making hydrogen through electrolysis. For methanol, we are trying to make methanol and we have kind of identified methanol as a base chemical. Then from that, with add addition of other things, we'll be able to produce derivative chemicals and thereby can solve some part of the carbon capture and utilization. So that is why we are working with methanol project. This is the last slide. So, so here I have tried to collate all these three efforts we are taking to come to carbon neutral and the path, the bottom part shows the path it will look like. Of course, the, the coming four or five years mostly will be, will be relying on efficiency improvement. We believe there is still scope for that. Subsequently, some of the technologies we are working will give us some breakthrough interventions. Around 30s, we'll be able to do that. And when hydrogen and say available at a at plenty, at a favorable cost, the much of this issue can be addressed, and hopefully we'll reach our target of carbon neutrality by 2045. But of course, we have miles to go. Thank you. Time. Oh, hello. Yeah. Thank you for that. Uh, you were perfect in time. Yeah. Well, well done. Uh, congratulations for that. Um, yeah. And uh, also, congratulations for your presentation. Uh, it uh, shows a, a very uh, innovative way, let's say, and a, a very lot of um, small parts, let's say, how to reach this. Uh, Great goal, yeah. Uh, it was very impressive for me. Um, we have um, time for some questions. Are there some questions from the audience? I think over there on the left hand side. Hi, good morning. Thank you very much for uh, the beautiful speech. Uh, my name is Alex Matsuo Sumitomo. I've got one question about uh, uh, transportation of hydrogen. So you just explained. Uh, uh, Transportation is about uh, 1,400 kilometers? 1,400 kilometers. 1,400 kilometers, yes. Then, uh, is that uh, uh, already established uh, pipeline or a road? You said a tanker. I haven't got uh, uh, your meaning clearly. Would you explain it again, please? So, this was particularly for this trial we are sourcing hydrogen and there are relatively closer locations available but the, the volume we wanted and the way we wanted is available at this location so we have fetched our hydrogen from that location nothing specific about that so so as we are now as we are showing the uh, neighborhoods that we are able to use hydrogen, maybe hydrogen suppliers will be available closer to us. So it is specific for this trial, we have sourced it from this location. So you move it by a, a truck with a special tank? Yes. Correct? Yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you, and there was another question on the left hand I side. I think on the left, uh, left corner you'll be able to see part of the tanker's photo. Well, hello. Uh, on a slide number seven, uh, one of the solutions that was actually implied was utilizing your low-grade iron ores, and uh, and it was implied that 17 kilograms of CO2 per ton of the steel would be avoided. But 
uh, based on what I understand, for utilizing lower-grade iron ores, you usually need to use smelters and coal-based technologies, which are very CO2-intensive. Could you please elaborate more on that? I could not see you. Neither could understand your question. It's on the left. Hand side. Okay, yeah. you have to come again, please. I could not understand your question. You have to okay. repeat it. On slide number seven here, on the top corner in the left, the C section. Uh, it is mentioned that managing lower grade ores could uh, lead to 17 kilograms of CO2 avoidance per ton of steel. Uh, could you please elaborate more on that? Because based on what I understand, you usually need to use coal-based technologies, which are very CO2-intensive to utilize low-grade iron ores. So typically, our ore is high in alumina. So what happens when we try to make iron out of that high gang content, high alumina content uh, ore? So our slag viscosity is very high. And liquid ice is also very high. So that, that asks for more temperature and more energy, so more CO2. So we have done something to, uh, to break this uh, long chain of alumina by some means, by some additives, so that uh, we don't have to make it hotter and thereby saving some fuel that way. Okay, thank you. And one last question, please. Yeah. The gentleman in the first row. Excuse me. Excuse me. Oh, there was another. We, we have time for one more question. I have a question. Maybe, maybe we can do the. Um, then, then Excuse the me. The gentleman I have a question. In the second row. A, a, have you asked? Excuse me. I have a question. Oh, uh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Thank you. <laughs> uh, thank you for good presentation. I am Kaviani from uh, Mubarak Steel Company in Iran. Uh, I have a question about the p page uh, 17. I think uh, you told about the um, capture of CO2 and uh, recirculate uh, uh, reformer uh, and inject reformer, yeah? Uh, I want to know how you uh, cure the CO2, if it possible, uh, explain the purification of the CO2 in page 17. Have you understood the... Please, can you remember the question? Okay, make maybe, it a little bit shorter, please. In maybe I'll come to you. You uh, told about the purification of the CO2 and okay. inject to reformer. So we are talking about this slide? Yeah, yeah. Okay. The left part of it, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. So how you are proposing to regenerate CO2? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. How you can uh, purification of the CO2? Uh, not purification, no. We are regenerating, we are converting this CO2 into CO by diaphragming, basically CO2 plus methane. Only direct. At, at a temperature. Oh, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, you. You see, you touched a field that is very interesting for many people here in the audience. Um, th thank you for your presentation again. I would like to invite you in the middle for a short present and one oh. photo, and then we can do the next speaker. Well, and then came, come to the presentation number two. Um, here we have Dr. Shin. Uh, a warm welcome also from my side for the presentation. And to give a short um, overview of his biography, um, he was in the research department for Finex. Um, after that, uh, he worked um, in the low carbon process research group in Boslab. 
and uh, leaded the development of Hyrex process, Bosco's hydrogen business iron making, and since 2023, he worked as head of low carbon iron and steel making R&T center and leading the R&T program of Bosco's low carbon and steel making technology, including BF, BUF, and Hyrex. Please give applause to uh, Dr. Shin. Okay, thank you for your kind introduction on me. Good, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Dr. Myung-Yu Shin, the head of Low Carbon Iron and Steel R&D Center of POSCO. I am very honored to have a great opportunity of presentation on the topics of update on the development of hydrogen-based iron-making process at POSCO, so-called Hydrex. Uh, firstly, let me start my presentation with the short introduction of most recent POSCO's roadmap to carbon neutrality by 2050. The, as you can see, the, 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 the roadmap of this uh, POSCO's uh, carbon neutrality by 2050, the, you can see the BF and BOF route applying low carbon technology and combined with EAF operation will cope with the 2030s NDC achievement and the demand from the several OEMs for low-carbon low, low steel. Early 2030s, the transition will be accelerated in earnest. POSCO established a new a target to reduce CO2 emission by 30% by 2035, with uh, including two high-rex plants in the future. The stepwise substitution of BF by Hyrex and EAF will be continued by 2050s. Under the relevant economically available CCUS, some blast ponies may be operated combined with CCUS. The reflecting the changes uh, in the uh, internal and external environment, POSCO continues to update the roadmap and set up the plan for iron carrier, hydrogen, and energy supply chain. As you can see, the Hyrex plays a core role in the roadmap. It will account for a roughly half of total production in 2050. The development of Hyrex is commenced since 2018 and target to reach the commercial performance by 2030. The most recent update on development of status will, uh, will be presented. Okay, this shows the target performance of Hyrex. The low cost, low cost uh, and abundant iron carrier, the Centerfit, directly charged into the multi-stage fluidized bed reactors and reduced by hydrogen. The reduced iron ore is smelted in the electrical smelting furnace, so-called ESF, with small carbon addition and electric power. The ESF produced hard metal and slag, very analogous to the blast furnace. Uh, this EAF, so the EAF enables the high FE yield and slag recyclable. The hot metal is converted to clean uh, molten steel and cast it in the conventional steel making workshop. Uh, this enables to keep the availability and productivity of existing steel making facilities and no restriction of high grade steel manufacturing comparing to the uh, EAF steel making route. This shows the process of Hyrex. You can acknowledge that uh, the core technology is the fluidized bed reactors and ESF. Uh, for the fluidized bed technologies, POSCO has commenced, commercialized the fluidized bed technology at early 20s and has the long term operation. Uh, of 20 years in, fi in finance France at Pohang, Postcode's Pohang Works. Uh, for ESF operation technologies, SNNC, the Postcode subsidiary company, is operating the large scale ESF for ferronickel, the alloy the product, ferronickel production, and secure the technology of construction, maintenance, and operating experience. Uh, given the uh, own technology priorities, 
the fast development of Hyrex is expected with confidence. Uh, considering the change of the reductant gas and to cope with the process requisite for the Hyrex operation compared to the Finex, the product based technology is, is necessarily revised on the following items. Firstly, revision of reactor design criteria, uh, the prioritizing condition, adjustment, adjustment for the hydrogen used. This will be uh, discussed later. And the design of multi-stage uh, prioritized bed system to reach the target reduction degree, uh, such as specific gas consumption, temperature profile, and residence time. Technology for high uh, reduction, such as raw material control and anti-sticking and plating measure is necessary. Process and plant engineering, such as hydro hydrogen heating, equipment uh, material equipment material selection for hydrogen use and explosion proof design on the hydrogen use. Uh, first, the uh, product redesign for hydrogen use, uh, I'll focus on the fluidization. Low density and viscosity of hydrogen makes fluidization less favorable when applying finex fluidization conditions. Through the cold model test and CFD simulation, the adjustment of fluidization condition has been carried out. It is found that 40% of fluidization velocity increase compared to the Finex to make up the low density and viscosity of hydrogen. The, cool, the good fluidization quality was confirmed. As shown, uh, the CFD model has, uh, shows the performance to predict and visualize the physical phenomena in fluidized based reactors. The CFD model is being extended to simulate the reduction reaction. The reliability and accuracy of computer model has been checked with lab scale and reduction tests. We are expecting the CFD model will play an important role, such as the pre-review of the reactor and process parameter design, the prediction of operation according to the change in conditions, and the cause and result analysis of operational troubles. Okay, then the reduction. This shows a reduction test leak simulating four-stage prototype bed reactors. The lab and bench scale test facilities are under operation. The lab scale simulator measured and record the weight of loss during the fluidized bed reduction. This enables the detailed investigation on, on in-situ reduction behavior. The bench scale simulator enables the reduction test with real-sized ore. The experimental shows that uh, over the 90% reduction is possibly achieved in Hyrex reduction conditions. In reactor four and three, the reaction process progress to the equilibrium extent of F uh, magnetite and vistite, and the metallization starts in reactor two and reaches 90% in reactor one. Currently, <clears throat> the various reduction tests are being carried out with uh, changing the process parameters such as bed temperature and gas oxidization degree. Uh, the test result will utilize for the verification of process design. The test leak will play an important role of pre-evaluation for the effect of OA brand in Hyrex operation. Okay, next is the most uh, serious one, the sticking OA during the reduction. The sticking between the fine walls <coughs> hinders and growing uh, causes the defluidization and further the stoppage of operation. In Finex, uh, in the sticking has not been experienced. However, the severe sticking has been reported in FINMA process. Uh, in FINMA process, uh, it reduced the, uh, it is very, very high, fine, high-grade OR in the 70% hydrogen rich gas. With difference to FINMA, Hydex aims to use the synthetic with high gain. In the reduction test of Australian OR with uh, hydrogen, no whisker formation and sticking are found. Uh, however, with other OR brand, the sticking occurs during the reduction and the fluid ice bed collapsed by the sticking, the largely grown particles by sticking. Uh, this is so to be attributed that uh, fast reaction by hydrogen at early stage 
and the role of uh, element in gang, such as alumina, might, uh, uh, might protect the formation of fiscal. This uh, details are on the investigation. The pro probability of uh, hydrogen reduced DRI fine is very important to feed them smoothly to the subsequent compacting process. The small scale uh, Leometa is used to evaluate the uh, pro probability of DRI fines in the evaluated temperature. DRI reduced by hydrogen is found to have a better probability comparing to the DRI reduced by carbon monoxide. Additionally, as the flux is added and passes through the fluidized bed with, uh, with OR in Hyrex, in Hyrex, probability will be enhanced. Uh, analogous to the reduction test leak, the test will be used for the free evaluation of the effect of OR brand, OR brand uh, to the Hyrex operation. Okay, sorry. This shows the measure of uh, heat to hydrogen. The indirect gas heating, direct gas heating, electrical heating are the possible uh, candidates for the hydrogen heating measure. Uh, from the viewpoint of energy utilization, the electrical heating is most favorable compared to the other using the hydrogen as the fuel. However, uh, the regional availability of renewable energy can affect on the economic uh, application. We are investing each measure uh, with pilot scale uh, facilities. Okay, to increase the hydrogen utilization, the gas recycling system is necessarily incorporated. The operating line is designed considering the heat balance and ma safe margin for attaining high reduction degree ranges. All the figure, uh, all the off gas from the fluidized bed is designed, recycled, while some portion of recycled will pass it through the impurity removal to keep the reduction gas quality. The process optimization design uh, tool has been developed by uh, developed for Hyrex. The tool is written in Python and Pymo. The uh, optimization library is incorporated to solve the large scale a non-linear optimized program with, within a few seconds. This optimization tool is being used for ba uh, balance calculation for process design and evaluation on change in numeric, uh, raw material and process configuration. Currently, the performance of tools are uh, being extended to include the reaction kinetics and thermodynamic prediction over fluidized bed and ESF. Okay. To smelt the hydrogen uh, reduced and high metallized DRI, the ESF design concept has been uh, elaborated based on, but also differentiated to the existing SNH furnace. The ESF furnace is designed considering such as the uh, robust structure, feeding equipment for briquette or powder of hydrogen DRI, cooling panels, optimal electro electrode control system and off-gas system for hot uh, gas recycles. Also, it is on the design to achieve the operational performance of uh, brochure cooperation, stable control of temperature and composition, monitoring system for the automatic uh, uh, operation, and select chemistry control for the recycling to cement plant. Okay, sorry. To study the melting behavior of hydrogen DRI, the monitor uh, melting test is carried out with 300 kVA DC arc furnace. The furnace operation has been adjusted for smelting of the DRI using the low risk DRI, HBI, carbonizing materials, and additives. Simulating the ESF operation, the 100 kilogram of hydrogen DRI from test leak is smelted mixed with carbonizing materials and additives under the brochure condition. The result shows the carbon can dissolve into hot metal up to 4.2% across the target content in ES operation. Uh, the simulation model of ES operation is under development, cooperating with universities. The model is composed of thermodynamics and CFD. Firstly, the model was developed for simulating SNS ESF and verified by comparing with real operation data. 
Currently, model is on the conversion to simulate Hyrex ESF. Okay, to carry out the more comprehensive test, the pilot scale ESF is under construction. Uh, the specification of pilot scale ESF is shown as following. Uh, after completion, the melting will be investigated and demonstrated under the close condition to industrial scale. The operation parameter for melting control with electrical power will be tested and found. The result will be basis for the stable and optimized ESF operation to produce hot metal with hydrogen reduced DRI. Okay, this slide shows the pathway of the, to the high risk development. As presented, know-how on the plant engineering, maintenance, and operating experience has been uh, efficient, uh, the sufficiently secured. The demonstration plant for Hyrex will be installed based on the, those know-how combined with the basic data obtained from bench scale and simulators. The Hyrex process will be verified and demonstrated at the demonstration plant. Uh, this shows the Hydex demonstration plan. In, in the left hand side, you can see the process, the process uh, engineering has been already done, and based on the process engineering, we are doing uh, plant engineering. Uh, the, the, some the result of preliminary engineering will be uh, introduced in the next slide. Okay, this slide shows the plant layout and plant tower arrangement for the fluidized bed and ESF. Uh, the plant will be located inside the Postcos Pohang Works, uh, you know, the, the former the area of foundry, brass furnace, and uh, stockyard. The plant capacity will be 0.3 million ton per year, which is, the, which is thought to be the cost effective size to verify its performance and uh, acquire the scale of data for next commercialization plant. Okay, as mentioned, we'll go for the demonstration uh, stage directly. The concept design has commenced from 2022, and the engineering is on the progress with our engineering partner, Prime Metals. Parallel to the demonstration stage till 2030s, the first Hydrox plant. Hyrex commercial plant is planned by transition of existing Finex number two. The step by substitution of BF uh, will, uh, uh, will follow by, by large scale Hyrex. Our final Hyrex target is 2.5 million. Okay. Uh, as you mentioned, last high forum, POSCO organized Hyrex R&D partnership and just suggested the participation from the still related uh, uh, institution and companies. Now, 17 members are collected, including universities, mining, hydrogen, and energy and steel companies. We always welcome the additional involvement of uh, membership. We opened the website. Uh, containing the, the private channel to communicate with participant and issued the first newsletter as shown. For the time being, we will focus on the technology exchange and sharing high-risk high development status in the manner of membership. Uh, as the methodology and process preferred, we will start talk over how to cooperate with the members of high risk R&D partnership. Okay, I would like to close my presentation with following concluding remarks. The R&D of Hyrex is on the progress with physical experiments and numerical modeling uh, combined with actual operational experiment from Finex and SNNC ferro-nickel smelting plant. Uh, several achievements acquired in the respect of how to optimize Hyrex plant process parameters and integrate into the process engineering. The pre-engineering of Hyrex demonstrates the plant being performed. The basic data for the EPC has been uh, secured. The engineering work was initiated in earnest for plant building. Okay, now the 
POSCO is intent to develop the Hyrex process as a reliable, universal, and globally available uh, decarbonization solution for the uh, steel industry. In this respect, POSCO is operating Hyrex R&D partnership as a techno technology exchange channel, information sharing of Hyrex development status and future cooperation. Okay, thank you. This illustration is made to imagine how the iron and steel works can be cleaner and greener with Hyrex. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you. Perfect in time. Congratulations for that and um, of course for this deep insight in the Hyrex uh, technology. Um, I, I think this is a very important uh, way on our um, path to decarbonization. Um, we, we have time for one or two uh, questions from the auditory. In the second row, please, on the right hand side. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, I am Vahav Okana from Asam Nittal, the Pondicil India Limited. So I have got two questions. One is, uh, uh, have you checked the possibility of conversion of Phoenix uh, to Hyrex in the near future, or Hyrex has to be built uh, as a separate module? Uh, the second question is, um, what is the uh, magnitude of hydrogen required, and how do you plan to secure that hydrogen uh, for this Hyrex uh, module operation. Uh, can, I, can, uh, can I ask uh, the first question again? Yeah, the first question is, uh, Phoenix is already established by POSCO, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, can Phoenix itself, the modules itself be uh, converted to Hyrex or do we have to go for a newly built module uh, altogether? Okay, so you know, the, as I explained, the, 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 the product technology will, should be traded from Finex to Hyrex because that we are changing the gas for the operation. So that uh, we need some adjustment and uh, uh, comparing to the current Finex product bed, the productivity. Uh, if we use the current existing Finex uh, product bed, the pro productivity will be lowered than designed for coal gas because hydrogen is, is very the light one. Uh, and the second question is, can I ask? Uh, what is the volume of hydrogen required for the first demo plant, 1 MTPA uh, or 0.3 MTPA, and how do you plan to secure it for the later commercialized plant, 1 MTPA? Uh, hydrogen volume and availability. Uh, now you're ask you for the, our relationship with Prime Metal for uh, what? No, no. I'm, I'm asking uh, what are your plans to make sure that the required hydrogen is available for the operation of 0 0.3 NTPA uh, and for, then 1 NTPA Hyrex plants. Okay, for, for you know, the, for the 0 0.3 demonstration plant, well, yeah, for the time being, we have no green gas available. So that uh, we will make the, the the hydrogen uh, based on the ATR, autosomal reforming process. Okay. Using the, uh, the, the, the natural gas. Yeah. It's a temporary, but uh, now that's, uh, it's uh, the most reliable way to get the pure hydrogen for the, hyd hyd the demonstration test operation. But in future, you are going to shift to renewable uh, source of hydrogen. Yeah. Uh, in the future, that's, uh, our other department in our company is has their best to secure the green, green, green hydrogen based on the renewable. But it should be imported from abroad. I think that the domestic the generation of, of green hydrogen based on the, uh, you know, that the, the renewable energy is very difficult in Korea. <laughs> uh, so approximately with your uh, uh, current uh, plant engineering, uh, the process engineering, uh, what is the range of hydrogen consumption you have added, like 55 kg or 60 kg or 70 kg per ton of DRI, or will it be dependent on the ore quality? So you are, you, you are work, so, uh, questioning on uh, hydrogen consumption unit for the hydrogen. Okay, yeah, so roughly. yeah, yeah. So it depends on how to heat the hydrogen. You know that for 
uh, hydrogen used for the heating, it goes up to 70 or 75 kilograms per ton hand metal. But if we use the electrical heating, then the, the, for the hydrogen for reduction is only 40, 40, to, 50, 40 to 45 kilograms per ton hand metal. Thank you. Thank you. And there are numbers of more questions. Let, let's take this uh, gentleman in the first tour, please. Yeah. Thank you for the nice presentation. So, uh, are there any limitations in the type of iron ore which can be used in this process? Because uh, to avoid sticking and any other issue, are there some limitations or any type of iron ore you think can be used in this? Uh, uh, you are asking on the ore where, that we have uh, considered. You know that uh, now we, develop, uh, we are developing the hydrogen to substituting our existing blast furnace. You know that uh, the most of the iron ore used for the blast furnace is the ore from Australia, uh, high to low grade synthesis. So that we are focusing on that firstly, but we would like to extend our available ore brand to the more, 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 more one. Extend, would like to extend it. But, uh, but you know that the Pruda is bad the technology is very sensitive to the ore brand, so that uh, uh, maybe for, for some ore brand we found some sticking phenomena, so that uh, for such uh, ore that we should how to handle this one, mixing with other ones, or maybe some anti-sticking measure will be applied. We are thinking in two ways. Okay. Thank you. Yes, thank you. We, we're a little uh, behind our time schedule. <laughs> From that point of view, Mr. Shin, I think you will be, uh, you will have a lot of talks in the break afterwards then. <laughs> okay, so there are a lot of questions. Okay, for, okay. <laughs> if you ever have any questions, do not hesitate to contact us <laughs> in the uh, coffee, coffee break or you can email me to make some questions. I thank you for your uh, <laughs> inter uh, interest for our high process. I'd, I'd like you. to invite you here in the middle of the stage. You will also get a small present and I thank you again. Well, let's shift from Bosco to SSA. Well, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Martin Pai. He is Executive Vice President and CTO um, of SSFP. Um, he is um, a Bachelor of Science in Ferrous Metallurgy and uh, he made his doctor in process metallurgy in the Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm, Sweden. He started his career at Danieli and uh, since 2001, he has been with SSAB. And uh, in, since 2007, he served as executive vice president and CTO at SSAB. Um, Mr. Pa is the initiator of the hybrid initiative and uh, he is also um, chairman of for hybrid development at, I, uh, at um, AB. He is currently chairman of board of Sverim, and uh, he is member of the Royal Swedish Academy for Engineering Science. He brought a presentation uh, with him with the title "Transformation to Fossil Free Steel with the Hybrid Technology," and we will have this presentation online. Um, Mr. Mr. Pai, are you still online? Yes. Yes. Perfect. I'm the, the stage is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Kurt, for your kind introduction. Um, sorry, I cannot be on site since I'm here at the COP28 meeting in Dubai. So I hope uh, I can run this presentation without interruptions. I got a couple of times disconnected when I was. Uh, listening to Dr. Xi. I should really get an update of the Hyrex development. Uh, next slide, please. Yes, I uh, will give a very short uh, introduction and then uh, uh, describe what we have done so far in the hybrid development uh, 
work, and then finally uh, presenting SSAB's uh, transformation plan. Next slide, please. Yes, without uh, 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 further going into these slides, we all know that the steel industry is uh, in the middle of this uh, focus regarding mitigating climate change, and that is the reason why I have uh, been spending the whole week here in, in Dubai, and uh, still quite some meetings uh, later today, so I could not join you on site. Uh, it's uh, clear that the whole uh, world is uh, really looking at uh, steel industry, aluminum, cement, uh, chemicals, and so on, the so-called hard paid sectors, how we can move forward to really contribute to this uh, uh, transformation. Next slide, please. Yes, we all know we are in the steel industry and steel is uh, extremely important. Without steel, we can't live uh, the way as we do. And steel is also an extremely good material that we can recirculate. Uh, however, current production technology is really emitting uh, too much carbon dioxide. That is uh, uh, why we are now uh, listening to all these exciting development works uh, moving forward. So let's uh, move to the next slide. Yes, we did a, a quite early an analysis. I think you have seen this uh, analysis in the past. Uh, uh, recycling is uh, the quickest way to uh, reduce emissions. However, the global steel uh, demand is uh, going to increase since more and more people will uh, uh, live uh, in a, with a better life. So we will uh, still continue to make steel from virgin iron ore. Uh, and that really gives us the challenge if we really want to keep the global warming below two degrees Celsius, now in Dubai, the coup uh, is a lot of uh, discussion still uh, not letting the 1.5 degree Celsius go. So that is uh, uh, really giving us the overall challenge of uh, developing a technology that can cut emissions significantly. Yes, next slide, please. Very, very briefly, SSAB is a steel company with a very long tradition. Our uh, uh, one of our production sites started making steel in 1878. And uh, we have uh, about 9 million tons of annual uh, steel uh, production uh, capacity. And we, we have a good uh, business uh, environment the last couple of years. Uh, the company is uh, debt uh, free and we have a good uh, cash flow. So we are now moving ahead with the, this is one of the reasons why now we are now moving faster with our transformation. Next step, please. We are running uh, the majority of our uh, um, production in Sweden, Finland, where we start with uh, uh, using iron ore from LKB, Northern Swedish iron ore resources. So we have three blast furnace sites, one in Luleå, one in Roa, and one in Oxelösund. And we run two steel mills uh, and based on electric furnaces making heavy plate products in the US where we are currently uh, or uh, still one of the major suppliers of uh, heavy plate on the US market. Next slide, please. I want just to go back to uh, uh, what happened 40 years ago in Sweden. Uh, there was a significant uh, step change in the blast furnace technology, which I Fortunately, I had the possibility to participate uh, as a PhD student during that time when uh, SSAB and LKB jointly developed the current production technology that's been using since uh, 40 years, where um, LKB uh, progressed uh, to making high quality uh, blast furnace uh, pellets, and SSAB uh, switched over our blast furnace operations to 100% pellets operation. Gradually, we installed the PCI technology and so on. Uh, on the, this graph uh, chart, you see that we have been running our blast furnaces with extremely low uh, fuel rate. Our average, yearly average fuel rate is uh, somewhere around 450 to 465 kilograms per ton hot metal, which is uh, extremely efficient. Uh, and one of the, another uh, benefit is also the LKB's magnetite ore. So also in the 
sintering process of uh, uh, pellet uh, uh, production, uh, the fuel consumption is also uh, very, very low. So that gave us uh, a starting point. So our current production uh, system uh, is uh, among uh, the most efficient uh, 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 in terms of uh, plus furnace operations. Next slide, please. Even with that, uh, say, good starting point, uh, SSAB as a steel company is still the single largest CO2 emitting company in both Sweden and Finland. In Sweden, we stand for 10% of uh, the country's uh, total CO2 emission. Finland, we account for 7%. And that is, of course, too much, uh, especially uh, with reference to both Sweden's and Finland's very aggressive climate goals. So that was one of the reasons why we uh, created a hybrid initiative back in 2016, uh, where we teamed up with the Vattenfall and uh, the LKD. Next slide, please. So overall, I guess uh, most of you have a uh, look at this uh, principal uh, flow chart uh, on our website uh, or other conferences. So what we essentially made a pre-study was to compare uh, with the current production setup using uh, LKB's INOR for our blast furnaces uh, with BOF process. If you compare that with uh, switching over to a DRI a shaft furnace based uh, uh, process based on um, electrolyzers pr producing hydrogen using uh, renewable energy we have in northern Sweden uh, and uh, uh, go over to electric furnace, uh, how that will look like. And that uh, gave us uh, the basis for uh, starting a significant R&D program that I will uh, tell uh, on the coming slides. One important component in this setup is really to also integrate with uh, the storage of hydrogen, uh, which we also uh, have uh, made uh, interesting tests and studies uh, and that I will uh, describe uh, later. Next slide, please. So that was the overall, uh, say, background of the hybrid initiative. And now I will go over to tell uh, what have been done so far and uh, what are our main conclusions, uh, which will give us the base for the investment program that I will finish with. Next slide, please. Yes, we, we started by uh, mobilizing the Swedish uh, research community. We established a, a laboratory uh, pro, uh, research program in parallel when we took the decision to invest in this pilot uh, research uh, uh, program that I will uh, uh, describe next slide. And quite early, we realized that this uh, uh, they will uh, uh, be needed to start the preparation for scale-up uh, um, phase uh, in parallel. So we have been running this, uh, all these uh, different uh, activities in parallel for quite some time, and we are now very close to the scale-up of uh, the uh, hybrid technology. Next slide, please. Yes, overall, from the metallurgical research perspective, we started by looking at uh, how uh, the pelletizing step could be decarbonized. And then, of course, uh, um, essentially further develop the uh, natural gas based shaft furnace process and uh, uh, understand this and, uh, and uh, manage the reduction in shaft furnace uh, using pure hydrogen and put significant effort to study. Uh, the behavior of uh, DRI product uh, properties, how to make that uh, uh, easy handle and good uh, to, 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 to use the next step in the electric arc furnace. Of course, in the arc furnace, we, uh, one of the big focus uh, area is really how to handle uh, the role of uh, carbon addition. And here we have tested uh, biocarbon to replace uh, fossil carbon. And with that, we can really uh, reach the goal of phasing out uh, completely fossil fuels that is used from mining operations at, at LKB and all the way to our steel products. So that is the whole, say, um, scope of the uh, methodological research work that we've done. Next step, please. Next slide. Yes, yeah, so just a few words about the CVRIM because this is an extremely important uh, part of our uh, research uh, 
capability, uh, most of you probably are quite aware of uh, what has been done in the European steel research during the Ulcos uh, time and LKB's ex experimental platform and so on. So we have significant knowledge how to run this type of uh, uh, pilot scale research uh, facilities. And to really to complement that, we uh, set up uh, a dedicated hybrid uh, uh, laboratory, really uh, making dedicated research work uh, to study how the behavior of uh, uh, I know pellets from LKB uh, uh, at uh, lab scale using uh, hydrogen and also study the DRI uh, before we, we uh, test the melting and so on. So this has been an extremely important part of our uh, development work. Next step. Next slide, please. So with that, uh, combined with the uh, say laboratory scale study, understanding the, uh, the thermodynamics and the kinetics of the reduction process of pellets, the single pellets, um, uh, uh, a bed of pellets in the laboratory furnace combined what we can now do with uh, uh, the campaigns that we run in the hybrid pilot plant. And after that, we have made uh, um, quite a number of uh, excavations that we can calibrate uh, our uh, mathematical models and uh, methodological models. So that really gave us uh, a comprehensive uh, possibility to uh, fully understand the sharp furnace process uh, running on pure hydrogen. Uh, so that, that is an uh, um, important base for us, uh, of course, moving forward. Next slide, please. Just a few words about the pilot research program. Of course, this is uh, the majority of uh, spendings we have uh, so far since we started in 2016. Uh, jointly, we have spent uh, more than 200 million US dollars in pure R&D. And that is, uh, of course, significant uh, budget for a small country like Sweden. But uh, um, we are extremely uh, satisfied with what we have achieved so far. As you can see here, symbolically, we, ha we have studied uh, how to uh, uh, take care of the first the pelletizing step at LKB. We built uh, one uh, uh, at one of their pelletizing facilities, uh, a full-scale biogas, uh, bio-oil uh, system, and we ran that uh, furnace uh, for more than one year in, in a full-scale trial, and LKB is now actually using this uh, also uh, continuously after we made the trial. We studied also using uh, plasma burners, hydrogen burners uh, in the future, and uh, there have uh, been uh, quite some uh, results generated, and that part LKB is now taking over and uh, move forward with their, uh, say, uh, transformation process. In the middle slide is, uh, is a hydrogen storage uh, um, uh, pilot, which I have a slide later on. It's an exciting technology that we have uh, further developed, uh, what we call the lined rock cabin technology. So we store hydrogen compressed to 250 bars, and that has been interesting um, uh, knowledge developed. Then, of course, the main really investment is the pilot plant uh, of uh, hybrid in Lulio where we can run the facility uh, at one ton per hour continuously, which we've been running many, many campaigns now since uh, 2020. And at this pilot plant, we have uh, a electrolyte, two electrolyzer stacks uh, from uh, uh, NEL, uh, which is, has a 4.5 megawatt uh, rating, where we produce hydrogen on site. And this hydrogen is also connected to the hydrogen storage uh, a couple of kilometers away from the electrolyzer plant. And then we utilize uh, Sphere's existing 10-ton electric arc furnace where we test melting behavior, study metallurgical uh, processes uh, of uh, melting leases from the hybrid tracks. Next slide, please. Yes, uh, uh, we, we ended up in the middle of pandemic, but we uh, really uh, put a lot of efforts to manage to uh, start up the uh, pilot facility. We started by learning running this uh, on natural gas, and then when we have uh, managed with that, we, we started the trial using, uh, say, hydrogen that we produce in our electrolyzer plant. And in 2021, uh, uh, in the summer, we, we uh, announced that we have made uh, 
satisfactory trials uh, runs, uh, running this plant continuously 24 seven on hydrogen. And we show this uh, HPI uh, as you see on the photo. And next slide, please. And uh, uh, later at the uh, joint uh, SSAB POSCO conference in Stockholm, we announced that we have uh, come so far that we can, uh, uh, with uh, confidence, uh, announce that uh, the hybrid process uh, can produce uh, a very exciting DRI product, which is uh, carbon free, and we can make it stable, extremely highly metallized. So with that, we can avoid the HPI step. And this gives also good melting properties compared with HPI in the electric arc furnace. And now we are moving ahead with this technology that is currently under uh, patent application uh, procedures. So that is uh, um, uh, what we now will uh, move ahead on. At this moment, unfortunately, no, I cannot tell very much details about how this has been achieved. But I guess uh, uh, sometime in the future, this will be published uh, uh, and then um, everybody can get access to it. Next slide, please. Yeah, so with this, uh, uh, of course, uh, ma making this uh, process working in a controlled way and with good qualities, we have uh, invested from HSAB significant amount of um, efforts to work with our customers in order to create a market for this phosphorus steel. So we made the first delivery of um, plate to Volvo Group um, in August uh, 2021. And next slide, please. And just see in a couple of months, of course, a lot of preparation work was done already before the delivery that L uh, Volvo presented uh, a couple of very exciting vehicles that made uh, with this steel, and this has been demonstrated. And the track to the right is actually being used uh, uh, since uh, that was delivered uh, during summer 2022, and there is a similar uh, uh, hauler that is now used also in the US. And uh, after that, uh, a number of uh, customer collaborations have uh, tried this uh, uh, still uh, from this small volume we can make from the pilot plant uh, by other customers. Next slide, please. Yes, just a couple of words about this hydrogen story because this is an extremely important component, especially considering for our case in northern Sweden, Finland, we foresee a significant increase of wind power in the electricity grid. So how to balance the grid uh, today the hydropower plants in northern Sweden are utilized to balance uh, the grid uh, with the uh, wind power, but with the even more wind power connected to the grid, we will need, uh, uh, say, additional balancing uh, cap uh, capabilities in the grid. So that is one of the major contributions from Vattenfall that we jointly modified existing technology that has been used in, in Sweden since 25 years, storing natural gas. Uh, essentially in Sweden, we don't have salt cabins that we can use. So it's in principle, it's a steel tank. It's uh, still uh, it's like, uh, have a function of a lining and then we make this uh, man-made cabin. And we have a compressor plant on top of the mounting and then we compress hydrogen, store it uh, at 250 bars. And that's been running uh, quite exciting uh, test campaigns. In the middle, when we don't run the pilot plant for D DR uh, trials, we run this uh, uh, storage. Uh, and now uh, the technology seems also have performed uh, in the way that we have uh, expected. So it's uh, also for this uh, type uh, part of the development work has been successful. Next step, please. Next slide. So uh, next step, uh, of course, in the hybrid development, uh, we have now done the, the, the pilot uh, scale trials. We have developed the customer um, uh, demand for steel, and now we are now doing the scale up. So right now we, we are uh, proceeding with uh, transforming uh, one of our steel plants in Sweden, uh, in Oxelösund, south of Stockholm, where we just uh, last week, one week ago, we had the groundbreaking 
uh, ceremony where we start the construction of uh, electric offering method. And the hybrid demonstration plant is uh, now prepared, uh, going to be built at LKB's mining site in northern Sweden using the renewable electricity uh, that we, we have there. And then uh, uh, customers that uh, you see on this chart, all of those have got trial deliveries from uh, our pilot shipments. They are waiting for this uh, commercial deliveries from 2026. So that will complete, say, the hybrid development work. And then uh, we will now uh, go over to the scale up and transforming the remaining of our uh, production systems. Next slide, please. Yes, finally, the transformation plan for HSAB. We announced in 2019 at the United Nations uh, uh, Climate Action Summit in New York that uh, we uh, were aiming at uh, becoming uh, carbon neutral before 2045. And now that uh, timeline has uh, been accelerated. So our aim now is uh, to make it complete around 2030, which is extremely short time left. Next slide, please. Yes, yeah, so this is essentially just a, a few bullet slides, uh, 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 bullish on our transformation plan. As I mentioned earlier, SCCB is running two electronics based uh, uh, mills in the US. And already this year, we have put uh, on the market a product which we have branded it as called the SCB Zero. What that is, is essentially uh, running on uh, completely recycled scrap, uh, but replacing currently used natural gas and uh, carbon in the uh, mouth shop and rolling mills, uh, replace that with biogas and biocarbon. Uh, and we have uh, now on the market around 40,000 tons of products uh, this year, and we will uh, scale up to uh, 100,000 tons next year and 200,000 tons uh, in two years' time, so on. That is really to build the market. Uh, uh, in the meantime, we are uh, implementing the uh, hybrid uh, demonstration uh, investment. Uh, so that is a good step for us. And then, uh, as I mentioned, oxidation, we will uh, replace the uh, BOF mass shop with the electric mass shop. And after that, is uh, commissioned, we will uh, shut down the coke oven plant, uh, the blood furnaces, and the BOF shop. And the remaining uh, facilities will uh, continue in Oxlachon. Uh, in Luilio and in Roy, we will do com uh, slightly differently because uh, uh, um, we have uh, uh, come to a conclusion that in Luilio and Roy, we will uh, do um, invest in two completely new mini mills for strip products uh, with the new uh, latest technology and then uh, shut down the complete uh, production system uh, currently are running when these new mills are, are up and running. I have a couple of slides showing that quickly. Next slide, please. M Mr. Pai, we are a little bit over time. Please hurry up. Yes, please. I will uh, now finish. Uh, yes, uh, the oxygen Next slide. is uh, only this mess up. Next slide. Here's uh, just a quick uh, uh, view of uh, our plan in Ludo Ox and in Roa, where we will uh, build these two new mills at our current site, and then we will face out to the Govern plant, plus furnaces, uh, melt shop, and casters, uh, and rolling and so on. Uh, and these are going to be completed around 2030. Next. I think this is the final slide. Uh, uh, we have a lot of customers waiting. And next slide. And we will now start uh, the transformation process. We will have hybrid uh, based uh, fossil free steel products, we have the SB0 products, and then of course, uh, still uh, possible to make uh, scrap-based uh, pro products as we do today in the U.S. So, complete transformation around 2030, extremely tough targets, but we're working to uh, realize that. I think uh, that was all. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Pai, for this very impressive insight yeah? uh, and uh, the successful things uh, you showed to uh, go away from fossils. Well, there is still some time for questions because we have to wait a little bit for the next speaker. Uh, start uh, over there with this one, please. 
Thanks, Martin. Thanks a lot for accepting the invitation despite your busy schedule, and I really appreciate that you joined even online. It's a, it's a quite a feat of achievement, and in the use are one of the forerunners, really, in, uh, in the hydrogen based reduction. Despite the absence of any large scale provision of hydrogen supply and everything, you are making hydrogen even yourself and trying to overcome all those obstacles with the scale up. So, I've just I've got a question about uh, the hydrogen storage that you highlighted there. There is this um, uh, vessel which is uh, in, the, uh, in the pilot. So when you try to scale it up, let's say 2.5 million uh, ton capacity minimals, roughly I would imagine that you would like to have some hydrogen in storage as, as kind of a, an assured supply, uninterrupted. So if we make a little calculation for one week storage, you will have roughly over 3,000 tons of hydrogen required. So it will have quite a large footprint. So, are you going to yeah. scale it up this, the same way like you have uh, in the in the pilot? Yeah, uh, just uh, to uh, thank you for your uh, uh, comments. Uh, we at the first stage of the uh, hybrid demonstration plant, where we are aim at uh, building 2026, uh, is uh, going to be 1.35 million tons of uh, DRI per year. The first step uh, we can manage without uh, adding this hydrogen storage. Uh, and now studies are uh, ongoing uh, in, in the future, uh, whether we, who will build this hydrogen storage or where. Uh, because we have a good starting point in Sweden, and northern Sweden has a good great uh, capacity. But in, in any case, this hydrogen storage uh, uh, could be scaled up. I think uh, one of the the most uh, possible uh, size to make a first scale up of this uh, storage uh, technology is actually on the west coast, supporting some other industries by Vattenfall. But essentially, it's a, it's a really relevant question. It's going to be one of the important components how to integrate the future hydrogen production with the grid. And the storage could be one solution. Right. Thank you. Can I ask an online question? Thank you, Ritzman. Yes. Okay, let's continue with you, please. Thank you. I'll just, um, we have a question online just coming in. Um, the, I mean, the DRI production process is fossil free. Where do you introduce carbon into the process to make steel and where, where do you source that carbon from? Yes, uh, we have uh, now uh, essentially uh, um, decided the, uh, the setup where we will uh, produce the DRI without adding any carbon, so it will be carbon free and uh, carbon will be added uh, when we melt DRI in the electric arc furnace. And there we are working with uh, partners uh, using biocarbon uh, that we can source uh, currently small volumes on the market, but uh, we are working also how to uh, secure future uh, need of biocarbon. Uh, in to make uh, the electric arc furnace uh, uh, process work well. Thank you for that. Let's go to the lady over there, please. Thank you for the opportunity. And this is really nice presentation and very informative to us. I would like to ask you to elaborate on the source of the hydrogen. As well, you have showed us uh, two examples in Finland and Sweden. So can you uh, elaborate on the capacity of these two plants in Sweden and Finland? Thank you so much. Uh, thank you uh, for your comments. Uh, yes, uh, the first uh, 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 plant where we are right now uh, proceeding with uh, engineering and preparation work, uh, there will be a, a quite a large scale electrolyzer plant built. Uh, uh, as you know that at LKB's mining site in Yelivori, there are quite uh, a big uh, uh, production capacity. So overall, uh, there is a plan to build quite significant uh, electrolyzer plants. So it, when we start, uh, we are not looking at importing hydrogen. It's really to produce hydrogen using the uh, electricity available in northern Sweden. You know. 
Thanks a lot. And uh, there was a gentleman, please, uh, in the second row first. He was waiting longer. So, sorry for that. Yeah. Uh, this is Ban from Indian Steel Association. I have one question regarding this hydrogen uh, protocol, safety protocols and handling of the hydrogen storage. What are the protocols? Briefly, you can tell us what protocols are being followed for safety. Okay, I'm not sure if I understand you about what protocol. Of course, uh, it's a lot of safety measures that we need to uh, to understand. That is uh, one of the reasons why we now do these uh, pilot trials. We have learned quite a lot uh, and discussed with uh, the uh, various authorities how to handle it uh, with care and, uh, and be safe. But essentially, of course, hydrogen is a gas that we need to manage and we currently steel production use limited amount of hydrogen. We, we use that in some downstream uh, heat treatment processes and so on. But when we go over to this huge uh, scale of uh, 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 use of hydrogen, that will become uh, one of the key uh, knowledges we need to, to manage. Yes. Okay. Thanks a lot. And uh, final question, the gentleman in the first row, please. Yes, uh, good morning. Uh, thank you, Mr. Martin, for this uh, very interesting uh, presentation. I would like to ask about, about the biocarbon. So on a commercial scale, uh, do you expect that still you will be able to, uh, to use a biocarbon? And if you will use a normal carbon, what will be the CO2 emission from the, from the, from the normal carbon? So oh, yeah. have you thought about it's that? A, it's a, thank you for the question. Yes, of course, we are now aiming at uh, using biocarbon. And we have, as you probably know, that in Sweden, Finland, uh, cut good uh, forest resources, so the, uh, the forest industry is uh, quite uh, developed. Uh, so we, 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 we joined work together with the forest companies uh, and mainly use, uh, uh, say, uh, recycled uh, products, for, uh, byproducts from the, the, the uh, paper and uh, uh, forest industry to make this biocarbon. Uh, of course, that will be a challenge if you go to places where we don't have this uh, uh, excess of this biomass. Uh, essentially, it's, uh, we talk about a quite limited amount of uh, uh, carbon that we need to use, uh, 20 kilo per ton or, or, or in those ranges. So even we use fossil carbon, uh, it will not be a big, uh, uh, say, fossil uh, footprint. But our aim, uh, since we are now in Sweden and Finland, so we really aim to, to go over to bio-based uh, carbon sources. Thank you very much. Thank you. Short questions to the technic. Is Dr. Xavier still ready? Okay, thank you. Well, Dr. Uh, Pai, thanks a lot for your presentation. We shift to our next speaker, Dr. Vincent Xavier. He's general manager, uh, manager for technical sales and marketing for Mitrex Technologies. And he brought a presentation uh, with him, Midrex Flex, Minimization Technology Risks in the Transition. One minute, okay, no problem. Can you, can you hear me okay? Yeah, we can hear you, but we can't see your presentation still now. Perfect. Yes, now it works. Good to have you here and uh, the stage is yours. Great, thank you very much and uh, thank you for the invitation to present. Uh, I apologize for not being here in person. Um, I, I made it halfway, uh, so I, I flew from Charlotte to Munich, and then I was going to fly from Munich to uh, to Abu Dhabi. But unfortunately, there was a ma massive snowstorm in Munich, and I'm I'm kind of stranded uh, uh, halfway. So um, I guess it could be worse places than than Munich uh, to be stranded. But uh, but yeah. So uh, the topic of my presentation is going to be uh, mostly about Midrex Flex, and uh, if you can switch to the next slide, next slide, slide please. Next slide. Thank you. Um, yeah, just a 
a few words about Medrex. This is quite just to leave there. Um, a few words about Medrex. Um, so we are a, a relatively small company based in Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, we have about 200, 200 people, and we pretty much dedicate our, our work to, um, to developing new and existing technology uh, for iron and steel making, uh, especially around uh, the Medrex process that you probably know about. Uh, we also have a research and development uh, center in Pineville, North Carolina, which is just outside of Charlotte. And this is where we do a lot of our uh, proprietary work and, and research. Um, so we uh, have been in operation for over 50 years. Uh, there's about um, or close to 100 Midrex clients built around the world. Uh, there's about over 20 countries now that have um, Midrex clients uh, in operations. And uh, we represent about 80% of the world of low carbon CO2 DRI currently being produced. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so uh, th there's been a lot of discussions about this already. Uh, and, and I actually heard this morning on, on CNN that uh, 2023 is now officially the warmest um, uh, year on record. Uh, so we all know about the uh, global market warming and the, 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 the CO2 uh, emissions roll into the, the global warming. Um, what I want to point out is uh, some of these slides from, from uh, the International Energy Agency is, um, of course, it's the goal to reach um, the, the sustainable development, the development uh, with, a, with a, the 1.5 degrees temperature uh, goal. Um, but, but the key point here is that there's going to be a multiple, uh, multiple, multitude of technology to be used so that include energy efficiency, it includes carbon capture, and of course, it will include hydrogen. And also that the shards and the, the different scenarios all include a kind of a gradual transition um, to this decarbonization. So nobody expects that decarbonization is going to happen overnight, or just going to be one technology, one big step change and it's going to go from the uh, business as usual, all the way down to zero in a short period of time. Um, so this is what, what we've been working on, uh, specifically at Midrex, is, is looking at what does this look, what does the, the iron making look during that transition, and how we can make that transition uh, manageable over these you know, 20 to, to 30 year period, uh, depending on where you are. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, we really start with the, the, the key point is the, the flexibility of this low CO2 metallics, in this case it's DRI or HBI. Um, but first of all, the technology is quite, um, it is ready today uh, using natural gas. Uh, and the technology can be easily adapted um, uh, to hydrogen and other, fuel, uh, other energy sources. Uh, the process is also very flexible in terms of um, raw material and especially the iron ore. Um, there's a little bit of misconception that the DR plant require uh, a high grade of iron ore. It's actually not the case. Um, the, the, the DR plant has been run with lump core. The DR process can be run with blast furnace grade iron ore. Uh, within some constraints, of course, in terms of strength and, and fine generations. But, but generally, the process is very flexible in terms of iron source. Uh, the process that will really dictate what kind of iron ore you can use is the melting process. So this is what this, this, this figure shows, that you can use a, a, a direct reduction process and the mid-range process, and depending whether you want the DR plant close to your melter and your melt shop or away from your melt shop, you can use hot DRI. So when the DR is transported directly about above 600 degrees Celsius in, in your melt shop, or you can make HBI, which is very easily um, transported and stored. And depending on the type of melter, uh, you can use very low iron ore into a blast furnace. If that's the, the melting vessels you have available, you can use a, a, a new melter uh, that basically is a lot more tolerant to slag um, than, the, than the EF. And of course, in some cases, you, you may choose to, uh, an EF to, to, to melt uh, your GI along with scrap. So really, the, the mid-range process, the direct production process is, is fits really well within that transition because it, it offers a lot of flexibility in, like I said, in terms of energy, in terms of raw material, and it can be used really locally, it can be used um, far away to metallic hubs. Uh, next slide, please. 
So the first uh, point I want to make is is we really that uh, is the viability of using hydrogen as a reductant. So uh, first of all, it, uh, using hydrogen for direct reduction is a, a well known process. Um, I think there are very early studies on reduction where hydrogen were done maybe 70, 70 years ago. Uh, the Midrex process has been using the majority of hydrogen in the reduction gas for over 50 years. Um, and in some cases, we have had some plants that have used uh, up to 80% of hydrogen uh, in, in, as, as part of the reduction gas. Uh, we also had a pilot plant in the, in the 1990s at the Midrex Tech Center that used 100% hydrogen. So this is not a new concept. Uh, it's just that hydrogen has never been available in sufficient quantities and that cost that made sense. Um, and even today, we're not quite at that point yet. So one of the, the, the most important points I want to make is in any case, because hydrogen, green hydrogen, um, is going to be produced mostly from electrolyzers. And it makes absolutely no sense to use electricity to produce hydrogen to burn it as a fuel. So in any case possible, we have to use direct electric electrification and use hydrogen strictly for as a reductant and not as a source of energy. Um, and the rest of the presentation, what I'm going to talk about is the work that we have done, or some of the work that we have done at our R&D uh, department and with our engineering team uh, to minimize the technical risk on that transition from natural gas to pure hydrogen uh, DR and, and HPI production. So I'll be talking about really three points. The first part is the process design, and we have, well, I'll introduce two flow sheets, uh, one that's 100% hydrogen, and what's that's a transition from natural gas to hydrogen. And then uh, I will talk about equipment design, the impact of switching from, from um, hydrogen CO mixture to pure hydrogen with does the equipment. And also I'll talk about uh, DRI and HVI quality. So if you can go to the next slide, please. And just very quickly on this one, there's, like I said, we currently have the Midrex process natural gas based. This is the one that's, that's really well known. Um, Midrex Flex is, um, so when we start introducing more and more hydrogen, uh, we can also remove uh, a CO2 with carbon capture. Um, so this is what that flexible process in between. In some cases where hydrogen is abundant and it's green, so meaning it's produced from renewable sources, then we can run, uh, we can build a plant that's 100% hydrogen from the beginning. Um, so for the next Two slides, I'll be talking about Midrex H2, which is kind of the future vision if you want, but right now this is really only available in a few select places in the world. And then I'll make the rest of the presentation on Midrex Flex. Uh, next slide, please. So the uh, Midrex H2 uh, is basically a, a, a simplified version uh, of the Midrex process where 100% uh, uh, it's fed with 100% hydrogen coming uh, either locally or source through pipeline or storage facilities or anything like that. We, we are actually process agnostic on this. Um, and the key component, what we have spent a lot of time developing is this electric heater. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, using hydrogen as a fuel makes absolutely no sense, uh, economically speaking, but also from a, uh, you know, from, from, from the better, best use of energy standpoint, it just doesn't make any sense. Um, so we, we have worked in, in very close collaboration with Tutco, and we've developed uh, and tested internally uh, a heater that we know will work well with hydrogen. Um, so if we can switch to the next slide, please. And this is really a, a, a simplified version. This is an engineering drawing of the, 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 the electric heater. Um, so as I mentioned, it's a, it's the, the idea is to increase the temperature of the gas from, you know, from basically uh, low temperature all the way to about 900 degrees Celsius using a series of electric heaters. It's a very modular design, just like our reform, reformer is. And um, there's a lot of safety features and a lot of things that we have worked on with cut, cut, cut code to make sure that, um, that the process was intrinsically safe. Um, and also because there is the, the electric heaters um, uh, are designed such that we don't need any kind of heat recovery system. Go to the next slide, please. Um, so now I want to talk a little bit more about the Midrex Flex, Flex solution. So 
again, if, if you're used to the Medrex process, uh, this is essentially an evolution of the Medrex process where we can start introducing more and more hydrogen as needed. And in some cases, uh, if there's a, a place uh, to dispose of or to do something with the CO2, uh, we can add a CO2 capture in the flow sheet as well. Um, so the process is hydrogen ready from the beginning. Uh, and, and that can be done really for existing plants. Uh, there are going to be a little bit more modification for existing plants, but really all the plants that we are designing today and something we're already working on have basically that concept in mind. So the, the, the plants that we will be building in the future will all be essentially hydrogen ready. Um, the reformer um, is basically the same design and as we put more and more hydrogen, the reformer will be asked to do less and less work um, because that hydrogen needs that have been generated on site and the reformer is coming from the outside. Uh, the shaft furnace is, is really the same, there's no modifications um, and like I man mentioned, the carbon capture storage, this is something that we have offered um, really for a long time. Uh, the, the limitation, the reason we don't have any carbon capture and storage um, in our existing natural gas plants is because there's never been a place to, uh, to do something with the CO2. So if there's a location, a specific industry that can use the CO2, if there's geological um, uh, places to put the CO2 for storage, this is something we can do. And actually we have experience in all of our MX coal plants that we have built, the one that are, are fueled by, uh, by uh, other uh, energy other than natural gases, we have um, CO2 captures for, for these plants. So this is something that we can and have done before. Um, there's basically, there's two ways to capture the CO2. You can capture it in the top gas fuel, uh, which is the line that's basically going um, into the reformer for the fuel, uh, for the fuel line of the reformer. And with this, it's a fairly easy step to do. It captures roughly 50% of the CO2 emissions or we can capture directly at the stack. Uh, in this case, we have to treat a lot more gas, but then we can capture about close to 100% of the CO2 emissions. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so again, looking at that, what, what does the transition look like? Uh, so um, would it be increasing the hydrogen content as the, the major effect is the reduction by hydrogen is endothermic, whereas the reduction by CO is exothermic. So in the traditional metrics process with natural gas, we balance the hydrogen and the CO for the, so that the exothermic reactions balance the endo endothermic reaction, not quite, but almost. Um, and this is what the Midrex um, but it is designed, the Midrex reformer is designed to provide that proper ratio of hydrogen to CO. As we increase the amount of hydrogen, um, the impact on the bed temperature will will be um, uh, will be that's what we'll be feeling the most. Um, so there's there's some discussions also that the reduction with hydrogen it is kinetically kinetically faster than the reduction with CO, but only at the same temperature. And I has mentioned in the bullet point below because the reaction is, is endothermic, we will not be at the same temperature. Um, and really the 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 design philosophy, what we use is trying to maintain that same temperature or being maintained close to that same temperature um, because this is the most important factor in the reduction process. Um, of course, it is a, a, a lighter molecule, it affects heat transfer properties, uh, and the, the point, uh, the most important point is what's on the right hand side, the little chart that says this is basically as we increase the hydrogen content as we displace natural gas. Uh, the carbon content will decrease. Um, but this is just basic mass balance. If we don't put carbon in the process, we're not going to get carbon in the product. Um, the, the, the little chart that's on the bottom left, uh, this is actually a tool that we use, uh, a simulation tool. I can't show you the, 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 the full working version of it, but this is basically a generic midrex plant, so midrex flex plants. And we can select on the bottom um, the amount of natural gas replacement by hydrogen, and it will show the different injection points, how much hydrogen goes into the different injection points, and what's the uh, CO2 uh, 
uh, per ton of DOI uh, emissions. Uh, this is kind of that orange, green, and, and yellow chart on top. So this is a very, uh, very useful tool that we have to, to show uh, basically what it does to process flows, what it does to temperatures, what it does to, to CO2 emissions. Um, <clears throat> So like I said, uh, operational targets, the key point is to maintain the plant productivity and as we really need to temperature the bed furnace more than anything else. Uh, we're going to try to maximum the, the carbon uh, in DOI at each point of the transition, but of course knowing that we, you know, at some point there's going to be less and less carbon. Um, and really optimizing the, the, the reducing gas quality um, and that's the, basically the amount of hydrogen that's available for the production. Um, and of course, this is going to be ac accomplished by increasing the amount of, of thermal mass in the, in the gas um, to balance that endothermic reaction. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so next slide, please. Uh, just one slide on equipment design. Uh, it's a little bit busy, I apologize, but I was trying to combine it on one slide. Uh, so the impact of hydrogen on the equipment design, and that's true for both existing uh, plants or uh, future uh, mid range flex plants. But basically, uh, the main difference is that hydrogen is a lighter molecule um, and it affects the, the heat transfer properties. Um, so what we know for, for, for sure that we will have uh, you know, more endothermic reactions. We have to balance that by increasing the mass, the mass flow of the gas to increase the, to, to maintain the energy balance. Um, and also the, we will require a lot more cold water and uh, less hot water. Um, <clears throat> in terms of equipment, what these, these three bullet points means is practically uh, in the furnace, there's no fundamental change in the furnace. So we, there's no size reduction, size change in the furnace. The refractories that we use are still uh, going to be a, a, a working, of course, on, on an older plants is something we'll have to, to verify, but uh, with the existing refractory, we have proven that it is suitable for hydrogen operation. Um, like I said, the, the gas flow is going to increase, the utilization is going to decrease just to maintain your productivity, um, and, and of course, the, our sea legs design will not change. In terms of reformer, uh, there's no fundamental change in reformer as either. Uh, basically, the reforming, uh, the duty of the reformer decreases as we put more and more hydrogen because it's convert, it has to convert less methane into hydrogen and CO as we put more and more hydrogen. Um, and what we have also worked with our, our burner uh, equipment people is to make sure that the burners were capable of handling that full transition from top, top gas fuel because the composition of top, top gas fuel will change in that transition. Um, in terms of compression, so uh, in some cases, uh, especially at the higher level uh, of hydrogen, uh, we will probably need uh, to, uh, to add a third compressor. Uh, but, but other than that, the existing compressors are fully capable of handling the hydrogen. Um, the heat recovery, as I mentioned, because um, um, <coughs> there's a little bit of differences in the, the, the heat transfer properties of the hydrogen, we may have to do, in some cases, uh, piping modification at different stages of hydrogen, because then it will make more sense to preheat certain gases in different orders. Uh, but this is strictly piping modification, something that can be done um, in an outing. And, and probably the biggest impact we will have with more hydrogen is because we are producing a lot less CO, uh, I'm sorry, we're producing a, less, a lot less CO2, and we'll be producing a lot more water, uh, the water treatment capacity will need to increase significantly. Uh, next slide, please. Dr. Chevier, we have one minute left. Maybe you can... Yeah. Hurry up a little bit. Thank you. Yes. Um, so the, the, the last couple of, of slides is really to show that we have done a lot of testing internally at, at our uh, tech center uh, relating to uh, the, the, the product and what the product looks like. So the first part is we looked at um, uh, making sure the product had the same properties in terms of metallization. Of course, properties can be different. And this chart on the bottom left shows that it's in all cases that we've tried different long board, different deoperate pellets, uh, the uh, metallization is improved by hydrogen. This is not surprising because these tests are isothermal. 
Uh, the other part, this, uh, the, the one on the bottom right only shows fragmentation, but we've looked at all the properties of the DI during, um, uh, during reduction to make sure that there's no increased science generation or clustering or anything like that during, uh, during reduction. And basically this shows that in all cases, except for that lump or B, um, uh, the, the DI produced with hydrogen is stronger than it is with uh, natural gas. Next slide, please. Um, and uh, I think we missed one, that's fine. Uh, and uh, the la last slide I want to show is, is um, so we have made some HBI from 100% uh, reduced, uh, for, from pellets reduced with 100% hydrogen, uh, about 400 kilo batches that we produce at our tech centers. Uh, these are the pictures from the, the HBI that we've, uh, that we've made. And then the next slide, please. Um, it basically shows, and this is just uh, four charts, four separate charts that shows essentially that the briquette density, uh, the strength um, and for both tumble and drop is improved with hydrogen over natural gas. So basically, this, um, <clears throat> this shows that uh, in terms of product quality, there's no risk uh, with switching from natural gas to hydrogen. And the last slide is my conclusion. One more. So the, 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 the most important point to note is that um, we are planning for that stepwise transition um, and we have that big, uh, that Midrex uh, H2 that's ready for places that have abundant hydrogen and well, have an abundant green electricity to produce the green hydrogen needed. Um, but in most cases, the, 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 the transition is going to take place over time. And as hydrogen becomes available, the Midrex uh, plant will be capable of using more and more hydrogen and decrease the CO2 emissions as, it, as hydrogen becomes available. And, uh, and this is happening right now. So there are, um, uh, H2 Green Steel has selected Midrex, for example, and they're building uh, full-scale hydrogen plants um, in both in Sweden right now, and we have several uh, Midrex Flex plants, um, including in Germany, uh, that have been selected to 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 really cover that transition. So so that's that transition of using hydrogen is happening right now at full scale. Um, and with that, um, thank you very much. Thank you very much for your presentation and the deep insights to the Midrex um, system. Um, I think we could make one question. Okay, the gentleman over there, please. Uh, I'm Vilas uh, from the Sul Berin. Thank you for a nice presentation, Mr. Wilson. Uh, mm -hmm. My question is to going to the transition phase. The existing Midrex plan how much you can replace the natural gas with the hydrogen percentage wise without going for the major modification? Um, so it, it's going to depend on a case by case basis. So this has to be looked at by our engineering department. But we think somewhere in the range of 30% of natural gas displacement by hydrogen is, is doable without any modifications of the process. So you are thinking 30%, how much CO2 can be? Uh, recover from that? Um, I, I will have to do the math, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, but, but it, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a pretty significant reduction, but we've had 30%. Um, I also want to mention that uh, Robert Montgomery from, our, uh, from the Midrex Dubai office is there in, in the audience. So if, if you do have some questions during the break, uh, feel free to ask Robert. Um, okay, thank you, great. Okay. Okay. Thank you. With these words, uh, thanks a lot for your presentation and greetings from Abu Dhabi. And uh, the auditorium, uh, we will follow with a coffee break. Let's make 30 minutes, is that okay? We're a little behind. Let's, let's make 20 minutes, okay? <laughs> Thank you for that. Seeing you back uh, in 20 minutes. Thank you.